no one really believes it. When you finally show them yeah. the book and there's like 50 words and you know three shapes and the whole thing, they're like, this took a long time? You're like, you have no <laughs> idea how long it took. See, I came from the other side of, of it where I started out doing storyboards and then I jumped into animating for motion design <laughs> people. Right. Okay? So motion designers would, and nothing against them, it's just, I, I never could get, <laughs> get it, but they would like look through magazines and then they go, I like this picture of this girl. And then they would trace it and then they'd be like, animate that <laughs> or something, you know? And yeah. so my job was always like, uh, starting out was always, if, if I can't imitate a style, then I don't have the job. And I was kind of like starting out wondering, what is my style? You know, I wasn't even thinking about comics for 10 years of my career because I thought that was just what kids did, you know, or I don't know. I, it wasn't a real career to me at the time. And so I was like, I can't think about comics anymore. Right. But And so I was just kind of scrambling to find the jobs and the jobs were always, and I could do them. I could learn these styles, but it just kind of, it pulled me so far away from what I really wanted to do eventually that I was just really unhappy with all the career decisions I was making. So I kept changing careers. But um, uh, so, it, it, and, and your approach was always, it seems like from the get-go, like your what your art teacher said, and, and it seems like you had some really good teachers uh, giving you good direction from the very start, which it seems like is rare in my opinion in, in from what I've heard and seen and yeah well it was even rare in our school I think as well I think we got a couple of good nuggets out of some real old teachers who were like just didn't care anymore huh. um, those are the best ones the ones that are almost out the door <laughs> and they'll just tell you anything without any sort of filter <laughs> yeah huh. <laughs> but the uh, but I think it was I don't know I worry about it too I still worry about it because this approach of sort of whittling it down and I don't think if I like. I think that it was this. I felt the same way as you did. Where animation people, it was the whole point was that you have to be malleable, right? Yeah, and there's yeah. a pride in that that you yeah. could like. You wanted to be that. You wanted to be shown a style all. guide and being like, yeah, I'll do that. I'll give you that all day, and I'll give it to you really well. Yeah. And you're, you know, what I mean, like once someone else has figured this sort of formula out, I want to be part of the crew, and I want to give you something that looks consistent with everything else you want to do. And I was totally okay with that. There was nothing, and I still think it's a really admirable, valid job mm -hmm. to have. All of that stuff. It's amazing when that can come together. And you really feel like you're part of a group and you're upping the whole thing. Um, but I think I worry, like, because whenever I hit something I couldn't do, that was my reaction was to say, like, like I'm, this, it might be good for the film that I, if I could do this, but I can see it heading down a place where in three or four years, if this is what I keep trying to do, I'm not going to be happy yeah. with my own stuff. And... I'm not going to be useful. Like, I think that's th that thing going into the studios where I found out that they were sort of watching us and casting us properly was really profound for me in the work because it was like, then my job is to take care of myself, like artistically mm -hmm. or, or, or creatively anyway, um, because that's who they want to be strong. They want to, if they're watching my strengths and it's just, my strengths are just as important as whatever potential I have to be bent or, or changed into a certain other style, it's more interesting for me to take care of, of my own thing and to see if that's useful to them because I can use mm. it almost anywhere. Yeah. If my strength is to sort of be malleable to the shows, that's a useful skill you can put in almost anywhere too. But it turns out that actually getting really specifically good at what you're interested in is like a hireable quality. And I don't yeah. think I knew huh. that. I don't, I don't think that I understood that, like, that, was, that those two things could both exist inside of like a larger project. Yeah. Some, because yeah, and you'd much rather be the guy that they'd bring on because you're good at one specific thing than the guy you bring on because you're a Swiss Army knife. At least I thought so. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I still think so. But that's, I, I don't think that the other side is invalid. I just yeah. think that it's, I don't have it. I just, I think I found out pretty quick that I just don't have the Swiss Army knife capability. Yeah. It might be just a different kind of artist, you know? I mean, maybe there are people who would hate to do the same style. And then there's the people who would hate to do every style, you know? Yeah. Um, but anyway, I always thought I, that that was a real lesson just watching how you would handle that stuff. And um, <laughs> it, I, I've, I've since been trying to be a little bit more selective. And, um, and I think it's really done a lot of wonder for just making me be happy with what I'm working on. <laughs> well, it so, seems like it. I mean, I don't think that, I don't know, it seemed like you... If anything, you've done it even more where it's just like you've, you've had 
your stuff has to float its own in a way that my, I don't think mine even had to do. We've always, with books, it's, I had the easy way in, right? Where there's teams of people making sure the publisher can make money. And so they're mm. putting money into marketing and touring and all the other stuff. Whereas your stuff has to, and it has, and it does, like you're always curious as to whether if you had this book and you just like put it out there in the world and it, would it make it under its own strength or how much yeah. of it is really due to, you know, visibility in some other way. Yeah. But you know that. You know the answer to that, and it's good. It's, it's a good answer. It yeah. works on its own and finds its audiences. That's so impressive. I, I can't even... It's, it's, it's really inspiring. I live almost in a vacuum, especially now that I'm here in the middle of nowhere, and I just come in and work by myself, and I don't <laughs> communicate with artists very much. <laughs> it's well, like, that, I think that's our job, though. I mean, or yeah. it shouldn't be our job necessarily to take everyone's temperature. And yeah, to take yeah, the temperature yeah. of everyone. Like your job more and more, and my the part I enjoy more and more is to getting into my own head yeah. and sort of saying like, if this works, it works, and hopefully the market fits it. But I've never been very good at sort of, you know, thinking about what other people might want and then trying to work to that. And I think that's like that's the exciting part of this job, right? Is that you get to go into your own head, and you, you have people tell you whether you're making something crazy or not. When you're like, have agents tell you like, look, this is really weird, or you shouldn't do it, and have editors tell you like, I'm just not feeling it, and that's you know, that's the second stage of it where you might hear that. But the first stage is yours. That shouldn't be, yeah. you know what I mean? Like that's, that's well, the most fun part see, of it. See, for, it it, for me, the second stage is I've printed this book and it's... Right. <laughs> and now the audience is going, I don't know about this one. <laughs> right. Isn't that interesting though? Like it, that, that must be so, because I, I have so many different stages of nervousness like that, where it's like I'm yeah. nervous the first time I show it to an agent or the first time you show it to friends and they say, well, I don't know. And then you're nervous again when the when the agent shows it to the editor and the editor's yeah. like, if the agent likes it, the editor's like, this isn't for us. Or the editor will finally show it to the company at large in one of their sort of preview meetings and the company's like, what is that all about? And like all these stages, things can go wrong yeah. and you have one stage that's like potentially like all of the, all of the stress from all those stages combined into one <laughs> thing where it's just like you didn't yeah. have any of those sort of safety nets breaking your fall, you might fall just as hard. But it's, I don't know, I'm yeah. fascinated with it though. I, I'd be... I would be interested in how it changes the work too, like how it changes your work going through those stages and how it would change mine not having them. Well, I, I feel like for me, the one of the things, I, I, I go through the whole paranoia of that too. Like I finished the book and now I'm doing a whole new one and I'm going to devote you know so many years to it. Um, is the audience going to accept this new one or not? I don't know. And then I finally get to this point after beating myself up and going back and forth and stressing out that I, I'm just like, I've just got to go for this. And I, I love it. There's reasons I love it. And if, if anyone out there is like me, then they'll love it too. And I just have to kind of trust <laughs> that. And yeah, so and you have way, to. I think that's, that's the amazing thing when it works is that like you trusted it and it worked. And it's like, it spoils you rotten because it's such a great feeling and you can't imagine... <laughs> not having yeah. it again like you just it's yeah. almost like a dopamine hit when it works and you're like oh man like i want like let's do that again let's because yeah. it just feels so good to make something well, in in your little room and then put it out and everyone's like yeah you're we're on the same page with this idea and it's yeah. so crazy well and happens. you've had it at a, at a huge level too i mean so so you're the first book that you got published, it won, what was it, two Caldecotts? Is that right? No, no, no. What? <laughs> There's Five? a longer timeline. No. It seemed, with picture books, it seems like this because they take so long to come out that they happen, things happen in like in groups. So the first book I ever made, the one that I think I was working on when I was ha having an office with you, we made two books there. And one yeah. was called, the first one, the one that, that, that Lucy uh, turned me on to was called Cat's Night Out. Okay. And, and you never very... showed me that. You were like, no, you're not going to see this. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was nervous because I was still really nervous because we weren't sure if I was allowed to be doing it. Okay. I, of course, you're not allowed to be doing it at DreamWorks, but even with Visa things, I wasn't sure if I was allowed to be doing it. So I kept mm -hmm. it very close to the chest. And also, I was just nervous because it was my first book, and I think I was figuring out while I was making <laughs> that one that yeah. I already... I already like figured out that I wanted to do this so badly for a job, and I was so nervous about making my first one. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah, just like your yeah, first totally. dip into this medium that you already kind of figure out that you love. Yeah. You're just so nervous about it. And so that was a small book um, just in terms of the amount of exposure and stuff it got. But it did win a, it won an award in Canada, which was really surprising because it was, um, it was a small book and it, and it got this thing which helped us get more work. But then after that, I did two or three more books for other people before I wrote one of my own. And oh, then okay. I wrote another one of my own after that 
and that one was the one that got the Caldecott. Okay. So what did you have before Where's My Hat? It, it, um, the, the chronology goes, for anybody, this is going to be really boring. No, but, it's not. Um, it, <laughs> it goes, uh, the first book was called Cat's Night Out, and it was written by Carolyn Stetson. The second book that I worked on was The Dark by Lemony Snicket, even though that I one remember didn't that come one, out yeah. for years and years. Yeah. Um, it was, it was, the publishing schedule got screwy on it, and so it actually waited like three or four years before it got published. Um, after that, there was one called House Held Up by Trees by Ted Kuzer, Mm -hmm. um, which was the first book I did with Candlewick, who ended up being my publisher for my own things. Um, after House Held Up by Trees, I signed up to do Extra Yarn with Mac Barnett, and at the same time signed up to do, I'd pitch them, I Want My Hat Back, which was my own first one. And by then I'd quit and left DreamWorks, and so we kind of needed to do our own, I needed to do my own books, because financially, you have to do a lot of books of other people's to make it worthwhile. With When you write and illustrate your own, you get a bigger advance and all the royalties off of it. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you sign up for someone else's, even if it's a hit, you're only getting half of that. And oh, so yeah. um, my agent's just kind of telling me, like, look, we need to start, you need to start writing your own things. It's just financially makes more sense, and I think you can do it. And so I Want My Hat Back was sort of the, me trying that out. And then the follow-up to that was This Is Not My Hat, and that's mm -hmm. the one that got the, that got the Caldecott one. Oh, okay. I thought it was. I thought it was the. I want my hat back. Huh. Yeah, I want my hat I back. Um, I think it was kind of a controversial book, and so they didn't. It was people were kind of <laughs> taken by surprise by it, and so awards things weren't really like they're such simple books anyway. I was surprised when the second one. Of course, I was, but they're such simple <laughs> books that I don't think that I was aiming for awards with them. I didn't really know what the criteria was for awards for these things. But I always thought Caldecott awards went to like big, ambitious watercolor you know, yeah. amazingly illustrated books. And my books were very simple. The ones I write for myself are very simple. I like drawing yeah. that way, but I don't like illustrating that way for other people because I just feel like they think I'm, I'm, I'm lazy or something. <laughs> uh, so, so at this stage, do you, do you have to take on a lot of, um, do you take on a lot of other people's books and illustrate it? Or are you just focusing solely on your own <clears throat> no, I'd, I'd like to focus more on my own stuff, and the impulse is to do that, but I'm still very new at writing my own things. I think that um, I still love taking apart a problem that someone else gives me. You know, that whole impulse of working in animation, it really does carry over, where you really love being in service of somebody else's story and figuring out the problems. And illustrating somebody else's text is a lot like a mini version of being a film director, where you get a great script, and you get to say, well, I know how to pace this and what the tone of it will be. and um, and you get to do that to a really great story that wasn't yours and it opens up sides of your interests that you didn't know were there and it's a really rewarding process it's just not as financially rewarding and it's also just you don't learn about as much about yourself as a storyteller because um, writing for yourself is just this crazy experience and it's really scary and it doesn't really go well all the time like I, I've probably wrote, written like 40 books of my own and three of them work and the other you know 37 didn't and it's a really heartbreaking process and it takes a long time and you don't really know what went wrong. I don't have the same tools with writing as I do with illustrating where I can sort of take it apart and figure it like, you know, with an like you probably have the same thing by now where someone gives you an illustration job, you have something to draw, you can kind of wrestle it to the ground no matter what it is. You can basically figure, like you figure, oh, I'm going to figure this out eventually. But with writing, I don't have that. I, I, it, I either drive it into a wall and turn it to dust or it works. Like there's no middle ground. I can't learn from my mistakes, that every single book and every single story seems to have its own unique things, and I don't know enough about myself as a writer and those levers and tools to sort of do a post-mortem on it afterwards and say, well, what do I learn? What do I know? It's a mm. really mysterious, scary thing. And so that's, I think it's more that than, than my preference as to whether I like illustrating somebody else's or, or, or doing my own that's guiding sort of my schedule. Because if I don't have a story that I think is ready to go and someone else comes with this great text, it's kind of a no-brainer, but it does, you know, it crowds your schedule after a while because those things will come in a lot quicker than your own ideas. Yeah. So let me get this straight. You you said you've you've done you've worked on like forty something books and just a handful of them you feel like you've uh, are, are happy with that the way they the story has gone. Yeah. Well, we were in kind of I'm as, I was in sort of a unique position though too because what I when we sold I want my hat back to the publisher the first book mm -hmm. that I wrote the publisher said okay well we'll buy three books from you this will be the first one. And we'll get you on contract for two other ones. How does that sound? I said, that sounds great. And, um, and it is great because it's a nice vote of confidence, but it's also kind of weird because all of a sudden you're counting on yourself being able to 
write two other stories. <laughs> yeah. And what I wanted, I think like that first one felt like the start of something, like I was so tonally comfortable with it and I kind of, it was the end of something, like a lot of thinking about what I wanted to sound like and, and draw like and everything. And I was like, well, I can probably figure out two more of these. And the second one I thought was going to be using the same characters from the first book, but not about the same subject matter. And oh, okay. I tried a couple of those and they didn't work. Some of them had some interesting points, but they all felt like I was just sort of copying the first one. And that's no good. You can't do that. And so instead, the art director said, well, try different characters. Try a totally different story. See what you come up with. And I came up with this idea of fish in sort of a cowboy gang uh -huh. um, who ride into town and terrorize everybody. And they're terrorizing bigger and bigger fish. They're little fish on their own, but there's a group of them. It was, the story was called Ten Bad Fish. And these ten bad fish, the first thing they do when they ride into town is they meet someone on the outskirts of town sort of who is wearing a little hat. And the first thing they do in the book is they sort of say, hey, give me that hat. And the, the little fish gives them the hat. And now we know that this gang is up to no good. That's sort of the way of establishing it. But it wasn't the whole point of the story. It was sort of a side thing that I sort of liked as a nod to the first book. Mm -hmm. And then this, this, these fish keep riding into town and they find bigger and bigger fish and they, they, they make fun of them or they demean them somehow. It's, it's kind of a mean book, which is why it didn't really work. But eventually they get to a very, very big fish who's asleep, but they're so confident by now and so up on their own sort of stuff that they wake him up and they're like, hey, get out of our way. We're, we're 10 bad fish. Do you have any idea who we are? And this giant fish kind of wakes up and doesn't say a word, but they realize they've made a huge mistake. Here's a huge fish. So they turn around and they head back like the way they came. And slowly but surely, this big fish is chasing them, eating them one by one, and it sort of turns into like a counting game. Now we're nine bad fish, now we're seven bad fish, um, okay. on and on and on, until this sort of numbers game doesn't add up anymore. And by the end of where the, the fish are sort of swimming, there's only one left, and he's still wearing the little hat that he took from that first character. And there's a giant fish somewhere off the screen behind him. Um, but we don't know if he's going to get eaten or not. but that's the end of the book. And sort of the rhythm assumes, or at least implies, that he will be eaten, but we don't get to see it. And it was this really heavy book. It wasn't all that funny. It was about a bunch of jerks. And, <laughs> but I liked sort of some of it. And the, the editor was like, you know, this is really heavy. And I said, yeah, I know. And she goes, well, what's the funniest part to you? Like, what's the most interesting, funniest part? And I said, honestly, my favorite part is at the end, when there's this one little fish wearing a hat and a giant fish somewhere in the book behind him. And she goes, well, maybe that's the whole book. Maybe just clean it up and try that. And that's what the second book became, was just the story of one little fish who stole a hat from a very big fish and was just a monologue about how he was going to get away with it. And it was a much cleaner idea, but it turned into, when I finished writing it, I, I wrote the whole thing in like 20 minutes once that whole sort of format came up, the idea of a monologue and the setup with the two characters only. It was a very quick writing experience. It was like half an hour. And I sent it in that night to the editor who'd asked me to sort of retool the thing. And then I woke up in the morning and read it. And I thought, oh my god, I've written the exact same book that I submitted last time. It's, it's about a character who steals a hat and then gets killed for it. Like, we can't do the same story. Even though it's a different point of view, we can't do this. And then she, she called back and I was like, I'm so sorry. I sent that thing in before really, you know, sleeping on it. And um, I'm not sure it's going to work. And she goes, I think it might work. I think that this is actually a really interesting idea, is to sort of do this thing from another point of view. And it's a whole different book. You don't need to have seen the first one to get this everything you want out of this book. And I was like, well, that's true. Um, but it was a real back and forth. But this theme sort of, of books about stolen hats that these three books now have was sort of organically, like it was. I was trying to avoid it. But every time I found a story that worked, it just happened to have that same plot. It's really a weird, like it wasn't a plan. But anyway, so every time we have to do a new book, so after that, the Fish book came out and won this Caldecott Prize. Now the pressure's really on to do something else. And I thought I wanted to do a third book, but I didn't know what they were. And it has to sort of fit the tone and the look of the other two. You wanted to sit next to them. And so that's a really hard thing is to sort of judge your own criteria that you sort of organically made up and be like, well, does this fit the series, whatever the series means? Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like feeling your way in the dark. And so you write stories that may well work on their own independently, but they don't fit what it is you're trying to, whatever it is you think you're trying to do with this, with this set of three books. And so there's lots of sort of small ideas that I still like but they just didn't work for these particular books and what they wanted to sound like and what I wanted them to do. And so it's not that there are 37 completely useless stories, but there are 37 stories that just didn't fit the bill right then, which is just as important for me anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, so from my perspective, you know, 
I, I see what you're doing. I'm like, wow, John, his style is so simple. I know it takes you a long time to really hone it and figure out those the scenes and massage the art so it's perfect. But I'm thinking, John's making these simple books, and then he's going and, and touring. This is I'm jealous, but you're telling me, <laughs> no, I'm going back and forth, and I'm writing 40 different things, and I'm yeah, doing yeah, art, yeah. and no, I'm it's, sitting it's... in the studio pounding my head against the wall. <laughs> oh, man. It was, it was, this last book was really bad. There was a lot of heartache with this last one because it really was that. And you, it's hard to sort of complain about it because no one really believes it. When you finally show them yeah. the book and there's like 50 words and – you know, three shapes in the whole thing. They're like, this took a long time. You're like, you have no <laughs> idea how long it took. But you, you sound like a prima donna when you complain about it because the final product is so simple and hopefully feels so organic yeah. that it doesn't look like it took this huge birthing process. But um, yeah, there was one I was working on for about a year almost, the story idea that I thought I could wrestle to the ground. I thought I just have to keep plugging away at it and keep rearranging these elements and I'll figure it out. I can figure it out. And then finally around Christmas time last year, I... I, I came in and I was there was one page that just the staging wasn't working on it, and I just it was sort of like I was just had to break up with it. I was just like I think I'm I think I killed it. I think I killed this book and my interest in it, and I don't think it works anymore. And I, that hadn't happened ever with the project. Like I I always usually try and find a way to make it work, but mm. with that one it had taken so long, and I was like I just don't think it I just I, it's not there. And so as soon as I did that, it became a lot easier to sort of find a new idea and get loosened up. But it took a long time to sort of say goodbye to this place and this story and these guys that I thought were working. But they just, it's a really crazy thing because I got a lot more touchy-feely about all of this after I started writing books. With animation and being in school, I was always really sort of logical about all these things. The story works because of X. The drawing works because of this. And getting really analytical and sort of you can quantify all of these decisions and you can make, you know, like an animation person would think that way, right? You can't be all artsy mm -hmm. about these things. You have to have recipes and you have to have things that can make this stuff financially viable. But, um, but with these books and writing them, it's very vague why it is you decide against something or decide to do something. And it really comes down to, strangely enough, like whether the characters feel like they're doing it on their own. And I'd never mm -hmm. had that. I'd never had characters anyway. I'd never been interested in that. But... Um, but it really, like, more and more, it's become, like, you make up these guys, and you have, like, a plot for them, but they start kind of working on the plot on their own once you've sort of given them the problem. You're like, well, what, what, what do you do? And it's not you're saying, what would I do? You're saying, what would this guy do? And it's yeah. totally crazy. Like, I've never had that. I've never thought I would even get into that. It sounds so hokey and so touchy-feely, but it really is, like, the only thing that makes these books work or don't work. And for a year, these these guys that I was working on for another story just weren't breathing on their own. I kept having to resuscitate them every time I opened the book. And then finally, the second the book I have now, these guys just walked in and they're like, no, we know what to do. Here's your book. <laughs> and it was just so nice, but it really feels like that, where you can't even really take credit for these things, because it just kind of feels like these guys walked in and said, we'll take it. We'll take care of it. Yeah. It's really weird. Yeah, I think I can. I think I can relate, and it it, t t it honestly sounds like how Stephen King and Neil Gaiman say they write stories. They say they just get to the point to where they know the characters so well that they let yeah. the characters write themselves. Yeah, and, and you and never they think don't so, know especially how it's with like Stephen end. King, right? Because he's such a a factory of stories, and yeah. you think there must be like a you know <clears throat> by now he must be so cold to the process, but yeah. but it really is like they it's this, and you don't have to be some crazy guy thinking like talking to yourself for that to creatively happen i mean it must yeah. happen with you by now with you like you know your guys so well yeah in those books yeah well for instance like my newest one it's it's about this little girl and i i wrote it out and i had the the general plot figured out a long time ago <clears throat> but as i've been writing it and drawing the pages this little girl kind of she gets more kind of snarky <laughs> and i'm like <laughs> <laughs> uh, and my audience is even like, as I'm posting it online, some people are like, oh, I can't believe this little girl, you know? <laughs> and I'm just like, I know me neither, but that's what she would say. I mean, she's like seven years old. I mean, she's kind of a jerk sometimes, you know? And, and luckily, there's other characters that kind of, uh, you know, make the story likable when she's being a jerk and, <laughs> and vice versa. Right, but, um, right. I'm just kind of like accepting that I just need to kind of let her go the way that she's going and it's so strange though right because it really is like a like a like you feel a strange loss of control yeah. when the whole thing depends on that and like how do you run like how do you make a business out of things when it, you really are just counting on these imaginary <laughs> characters to tell you what to do 
like how how does that fit into like paying rent and or a mortgage yeah. or something but it but that that really like I don't know that seems to be the way of these things and and maybe sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't but you're just kind of you're working really hard but you have to sort of just wait for these guys to walk in and tell you what to do it's really yeah. weird yeah yeah oh how interesting well it's neat to hear <laughs> that you go through the same struggle and yeah. it seems like I mean yeah I mean I feel you're working on something for that long and then b- abandoning it um, that's kind of how I was with the animated version of my com my remind comic I worked on it seven years and then it was like done you know it's not working anymore I need to but you know it's the same story I just changed it all and did it in a different medium so <laughs> right you can usually I think that once you've given up on it you don't mind kind of salvaging pieces and parts yeah. from it later on because it's just this like old dead skeleton of a, of a story that was alive for a minute but the but yeah it is it is really hard to sort of put it down because you really it feels like a failure I think that I don't know maybe it is the animation part of it too where you just you almost want to be a really good mechanic where you can just pop the hood on these stories and just yeah. go in there and be like oh I know where it's where it's feeling bad here I'll, I'll fix that and tighten it over here and that's yeah. a skill I really admire in people where they can sort of listen to a story and be like oh it doesn't feel right in act two or whatever it is like they have this crazy ear for that stuff and I really love that and it's like well that's what I'm that's what I want to be good at so maybe I should just keep doing that until I get better at it with this story but it just felt like with that one, it just the wheels fell off. Everything just one morning, yeah. the whole car just fell apart. But do you think it's a separation of a formulaic story versus the kind of um, I don't know non-formulaic? Because there's definitely two different camps, uh, you know. Um, yeah. And it's like it seems like the animation side of it is, and, and you know, you see in movies and in when you're in DreamWorks and stuff, it's like it's very a very formulaic uh, method. And what you're describing is like the opposite which is like what Stephen King says he hates the formula he just wants to let it be alive you know um, yeah i think that the for- i don't think that those two things are necessarily mutually exclusive that might be yeah. naive to say but i think that if you find like these guys can breathe and talk to you and that doesn't mean that they can't follow some sort of a structure yeah yeah um, true often i think you can find people that are like you know stories that just seem to be totally natural to themselves and it's so exciting to find like a story that you really love that just feels like it's its own thing completely and then you see the analysis of it and it's like well no no I mean granted this is a great story and it's and everyone loves it but look at how mechanically beautiful it is and yeah. how it really does huh. follow these really sort of standard touch I don't have any resistance to to analysis embracing both and yeah yeah I like that kind of thing and I like arcs and I like those that like yeah. it's I remember between the first and the second book, I got I got into sort of trying to do my own thing and being like, ah, oh, screw it, I don't need any of these things. But I couldn't think of the story, and so I finally <laughs> got really panicked. And I, a friend of mine lent me a book about playwriting. It was like this old book, but I think it was sort of like the older version of like Robert McKee's book. Yeah. Um, where it was just like, when you have a character in a play, this is what they need to do. And you're like, oh, this guy is full of crap. I don't need this. But then the first thing I read that he wrote in the book was that a character... You don't have a story. I think what he said is that you don't have a story unless somebody wants something. Huh. And I thought, that's crap. That is no way I can find a story. Like, like that's just. And then the more I got into it, the more I was like, actually, that's super useful. And he's probably right. And it doesn't mean that you're giving up any sort of creative license on your own. It just helps you clarify those things. And I yeah. think you can break those rules inside or you can find different reasons for them and your own ways in. But I don't have any problems with with those. I don't go. I don't seek them out very often. But I really do like taking films that I really love and things that seem very mysterious and kind of analyzing them and, and yeah. what other people think of them. It's probably not a great habit because these, some <laughs> things should just stay magical. But when I'm really interested in something, I do find myself going and re- reading what other people sort of how do they break it down? What does yeah. this mean? And why does this work? And it's really fun, and yeah. it gives you hope because it sort of says, well, okay, then. And I don't think the writer necessarily knew that. I get lots of stuff like, like I say, both all three of these books. Well, the third one not so much, but certainly the first two that I've written. When they finally are ready to go, you write them very fast, and you're not necessarily thinking about the form yeah. or the structure or anything. They just sort of come out, and it doesn't mean you haven't been getting ready for that a little bit, sort of subconsciously or whatever. But um, you couldn't say why, like, the, the objective reasons for this. But if someone ever went in there and analyzed it separate from you, they do it all the time. Or they're like, well, this is why this works. And you're like, and you as the author are learning things. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that is why that works. Like, you didn't know. It's not your job to sort yeah. of analyze. Like, you are really following your gut. 
but your gut might have a structure. Your gut yeah. might might yeah. have these rules in their head, and things feel right because of them. I don't think that a lot of authors are really into, you know, they don't have these check boxes on their desks or anything where they're like, well, now I hit the denouement, or now I hit the second act, whatever. Yeah. Um, but it just when you're taking your temperature in a story and you're just sort of going through it, you're like, well, I, I want it to feel high. I have to build this moment up before I drop it or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's just mm -hmm. as structural as anything else. Yeah, true. That's true. Do you do you find yourself find, like landing on one way or the other with that kind of stuff? Do you think? It oh, I I go back. I've I've been similar to you to where I've read like Save the Cats, read all these, you know, uh, like yeah. studied the hero's journey. Um and then I've gone the complete opposite direction. Like, no, I'm not going to do any of that. It's going to be unique. But um, then I do something as weird as Remind, and then I compare it to the hero's journey. I'm like, oh, it did kind of follow that. Structure. Yeah, I think that's the best you way know? to do it. I don't think that it's good to go in there with these things that you're coloring yeah. in the lines. And but it's interesting to go back and find out that it fit. Yeah, and and what I what I kind of do is just it was a, a director friend of mine um, would told me this once he's he, when we were seeing a movie it was some movie that was super popular everyone loved it and then um he was just like what did you think about it? And i was like well i was kind of bored he's like well then it failed it's because <laughs> it was boring it's like the hype is the reason it's popular but the way it was done um was boring to you and so in that sense it, it failed and so i've kind of just kind of kept that in like when i'm working on a story um instead of thinking of structure i'm thinking am i bored you know yes am, am, yeah am i completely losing interest well then let's throw something in there to make it way more exciting right now you know? yeah and um, also i think that like just writing this stuff off to, to just being plain entertaining there's nothing wrong with that like i think that when people are entertained it means they're emotionally involved a lot yeah. of times and that yeah. means you're doing things right People, a lot of my favorite authors, when you, when, when they're, if you read interviews with them and stuff, they just say, well, I just want to, like, look, I'm not here to sort of expound any profound truths or, or, or get at the heart of something. I just want it to be entertaining. But in the process of making that and doing what you're talking about, where you're like, well, I'm just bored, that means you haven't gotten into their hearts at all. You yeah, haven't yeah. done anything there. And yeah. it's just, there's, it's the same thing. You can, I like reading Hitchcock stuff because he's one of the only guys oh, I yeah. think that who can, who really did, I think, when he was doing it, he knew the names for the things he was doing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he could tell you, and there's so few people who can do it really well and also sit down and be like, well, let me tell you about the nature of suspense. And you're like, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. it's so cool that he knew, like, sort of all these formal things that he was basically writing himself, like, forget those rules that he's basically knowing and writing himself, yeah. but that he knew it. It wasn't just intuition and it wasn't just this great talent. Like, he, it was a little catalog of these rules. It's really fun to read it. I love yeah. that stuff. Yeah, Hitchcock says, it, he's like one of the best examples of just completely outside the box, uh, but completely mainstream. <laughs> but completely mainstream. And also just like, yeah. it's so much fun watching those things because he's having so much fun yeah. and he's having fun with the rules. Yeah, he understands the rules and he's like, he's not, he's breaking them, but he's, he's breaking what you thought they were. Cause yeah. you're not, it's not going to work if it doesn't have rules and he knew it. Yeah. But it's so much fun watching that stuff because he's having so much fun with like, he's saying, well, this works because of this. Yeah. And he, and he, and sometimes they wouldn't work. He had this great interview that I read the other day about suspense and the difference between suspense and terror, I think. And it was great because he said something like, um, uh, it was he was alluding to a film of his that didn't work, where it was a boy holding a bomb on a bus. And he says, and we built this all this suspense, but he says, and then the bomb blows up and the boy is in the bus still and everyone else is still on the bus. And he, and he says, and it didn't work. I betrayed my, my, my audience's trust and I heard from everybody that they would have rather I was on that bus than the little boy. <laughs> and, like, and like he knew when he'd lost it too. He says, every now and then I try and push it and it breaks. And it's not, and like he's, and he doesn't know it when he's making it. He thinks he's breaking the rule in a good way, but he finds out over and over again that the audience knows what they want. Like deep yeah. down, they know when they're, when they're upset and yeah. when it doesn't work. And it doesn't, you don't, you don't have to be Hitchcock to know that that scene upsets you. Yeah. You're just upset. And it's, it's really interesting, all that stuff. And he really takes it to heart. He's like, well, that didn't work. It doesn't work. And he, like, he learns his lesson. And then he says, well, and he remembers that time when he broke it and it didn't work too. It's yeah. really fun. Yeah.